those hands. We got some fun today here at Arise Miami. Are you excited to be here? Sing this part. Let every day that I pray praise the Lord. Come on, clap your hands. Praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm praising the body. I'll praise on the mountain. Come on. I'm praised when I'm sure. I'm praised when I doubt it. I'll praise when I'm numbered. Praise when surrounded. Cause praise is the water, my enemies drowning. As long as I'm breathing, I have a reason to praise the Lord, oh my soul. So much to be thankful for today, even with the storms. It doesn't matter the storms, it matter just what happened. 
there's a God that's here involved with us today that he's your champion you believe that today if he's your champion in your life today I want you to stand up I want you to get close and sing these words for me I know you're out there you may not want to step out of the boat but I think today you need to step out of the boat and proclaim that he is your champion it doesn't matter what you did yesterday it won't matter what you did tomorrow there's a God that's bigger than any fear. Anything you did that's going to lift you up, he's going to pick you up. And that champion is here with us today. We got baptisms today. And he's going to be crying and laughing and, and just be joyful. So sing this part. I've tried so hard to see it. It took me so long to believe it. You choose someone like me to carry your victory. Perfection could never earn it. You give what we don't deserve, and you take those broken things and raise them to glory. Come on, church. Now I can finally see it. You're teaching me how to receive it. So let all the striving cease. This is my victory.
Giants fall when you stand undefeated. Come on, every battle you won. I am who you say I am. You crown me with confidence. I am seated in the heavenly place undefeated by the power. The best thing is to wait on the Lord. He'll make a way for you. Just wait on the Lord. Good. 
Saturday day, Lord, you renew our strength as we worship you, Lord. I pray that the worship that comes out of our minds, that comes out of our hearts, be acceptable to your ears, Lord. Transform us. Let the message that's going to be spoken today reach our hearts. We invite the Holy Spirit to penetrate our hearts and our souls, Lord, so that we can make that decision to give our lives to you on a daily basis. In your name I pray, amen. Hey, 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 how's it going, guys? Good morning. My name is Link, and I am the youth pastor here at Arise Miami, and I have this saying, and it goes like this. As soon as you walked in through those doors or clicked the link to this video, you automatically became part of the Arise Miami family. You are welcome, you are accepted, and you are loved. Welcome to the family, guys. Today, we have such an amazing Saturday. Uh, we're so excited for today. Our first announcement is this, Life Groups. If you do not know what Life Groups are, Life Group is how we here at Arise Miami do community. The best way I can describe Life Group for you is experiencing the Bible with, with fellow believers. That's what it is. It's not a Bible study, although we read the Bible, but it, it's not a Bible, so it's really hard to explain. That's why I think the best definition that we have come up with is experiencing the Bible with people. Because let me tell you, life is better when you do it together. You were not meant to be doing life alone. You're meant to be doing life with people, family, friends, with God, right? And that's why we value life group because it's a way that we do community. At Arise today, like I said, today is a special day. We have a baptism today, not one, not two, not yeah, yeah, three. We have three baptisms today, right? We are celebrating. If you guys came today for the first time, you guys came on an excellent day because today we're going to be partying, all right? And here's the sad part. We're going to be having a great time here, but the party in heaven is going to be so much better than the party that we have here because the Bible says that when souls give their lives to Jesus, there is a party in heaven. And I just can't imagine. I wish I could be there. I wish I could see this party. I wish I could see the angels dancing and Jesus dancing, right? Because man, that just sounds amazing. And it sucks that we're going to be celebrating here, but I know it's not going to be the same. But we're happy. We're excited. Three souls are giving their lives to Jesus. Daylene, Johnny, the bassist right here, slash drummer. And we also have Carlitos who's giving his life to God as well. And today we are celebrating that. At Arise, 
We want to be discom- we want to become disciple makers. We want to be more like God. Now we were, we are we were created in the image of God, and one thing about God is that He is a generous giver. You were here today because God has provided for you all the days of your life. You have survived 100% of all the bad days in your life because God has been there with you. He is a cheerful giver. And if we were created in the image of God, then by giving, we are also being like God. Giving is a way to become like God. Now, at Arise, we follow the biblical uh, commandment of returning our tithes or 10% to God. If, if you're here for the first time, we're, we're not expecting you guys to give. What we want you to do is ex- experience the worship here. We want you guys to have a great time worshiping God together. But let me tell you, there is a blessing when giving. One of my good friends taught me this, and it's, it's, it's tattooed in my brain. It's a, he said this, you can never outgive God. I challenge you to try to outgive God. <laughs> There's a song called, He's Never Lost a Battle. Let me tell you. You try and outgive God, that's a battle you're going to lose. But it's when we give that we become more like our Heavenly Father, who is a cheerful giver. So I encourage you to give. Give to God and see how He blesses you in a way that you never thought you could, you'd be blessed. Right now, I want to invite Pastor Kendall to come up because he has a special announcement for us. We have some interesting stuff coming up the next few weeks, right? We do, we do. And... um. I'm sitting there and I'm like, dude, I love the fact that Link is here, man. Amen? Ah, the energy on this guy. The beard, the hair, like all these things that are wonderful about this dude right here. So I just want to let you guys know that we have a spiritual experience that is coming up at the end of the month. And I want you to write it down. I want you to make a note of it because October 26 and 27, uh, that's a Thursday and Friday. We're going to be here, and if you've never had a special time to separate, to spend time in prayer and praise and in fellowship, I want to invite you to the spiritual experience. And so at the end of the month, Thursday, Friday, 26 and 27, we're going to dedicate that time beginning at 730 to help you guys experience something that you may not have experienced yet. And I know that you're busy. I know that you have jobs. I know you wake up early. You know, some of you earlier than, you know, there's a football game, Thursday night football. All right, we're not going to show it. But (laughs) give yourselves an opportunity to experience something you may not have experienced yet by doing something you may not have done yet. All right? So that's what I want to tell you Thursday, Friday, and of course, we're going to finish on Saturday. We're going to have a spiritual revival, 730 There's going to be food here. I know Elsa's going to feed you. Elsa loves feeding people. And we're actually going to do something that some of you may not have experienced, but it's going to involve prayer, praise, listening, and fellowshipping with each other. So I can't wait to share that with you. All right, guys, let us pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity we have on the Sabbath day, the Saturday, Lord, to reconnect with you, recharge our spiritual, emotional, physical batteries, Lord. I pray that today we're able to rest, rest in you, rest with our friends, rest with great food, Lord, fellowship. I pray that this gives us the energy we need to go out next week, Lord, and be the best examples of you that we can be. Transform us as a little bit of, transform us every day. Remove a little bit of us and replace him with a little bit of you, God, so that we can show the world how awesome you are. In your name I pray. Amen. Stand up and sing with me. And sing of a God who never fails. He will never fail. Spirit, 
washed in his blood and what he did for me on Calvary is more than enough cause I trust in God my Savior the one who will never
Walk on the water, who? 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 Child, come on in. Look on the water. Got no trouble with the mess you've been. Got on the water, ooh. Walk on the water, ooh. Walk on the water, ooh. Walk on the water. Good morning, Arise Miami. Good morning, thank you guys for being here. I know what some of you must be thinking. There's no mistake, there's no production error to correct. Um, the reason why I'm standing here in front of you right now is because I, for some strange reason that's still unknown to me, I was asked to deliver today's message to our church. And what a fitting topic it is because today I'm going to be discussing the topic of doubt. As you can all probably imagine, I experienced a lot of doubt when Kendall asked me about a month ago if I would be called to deliver this message today on this Sabbath in front of our entire church congregation. The truth is, I'm not qualified to be here. I'm not worthy to be here. But God called on me and I'm simply here to obey him. So, I'm not qualified, I'm not worthy, and I need all the help that I can possibly get. So if you could all please join me for a quick moment of prayer, please bow your heads. I would really appreciate that. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath morning. Thank you for giving us the gift of this Sabbath where we can rest in your presence, where we can praise and worship your name and fellowship with our families and friends. Dear Lord, I thank you for this immense opportunity, for this honor and immense responsibility to deliver your word today. I'm not worthy, so I need your help. Please anoint me with your Holy Spirit Allow your words to flow through me, not mine. I pray, I pray that your message today may reach someone's heart today. May it open up their heart so they can experience the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit can penetrate them and it may call them to draw closer in relationship with you. I pray this in your son's heavenly almighty name, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So, to start things off, let's start really basic, and let's just start by defining the word doubt. See, Merriam-Webster's definition of doubt is a lack of confidence or distrust. It is an inclination to not believe or not to accept. Or better yet, it is an uncertainty of belief or opinion that often interferes with decision making. As some of you may or may not know, I'm a practicing mental health counselor, and I've provided a wide range of therapeutic services to all types of patients. I've provided behavior analysis and behavior modification to children with special needs and parent training for their families. I've provided marriage counseling to couples at the brink of divorce. And I've provided, I've helped patients, victims of domestic violence and human trafficking. And currently, I work at a crisis stabilization unit in a Florida state prison. So naturally, I work a lot with doubt in my life. On a daily basis, I work with inmates that suffer with extreme fear, anxiety, 
depression, all sorts of mental health disorders from PTSD to bipolar, schizophrenia, severe psychosis, antisocial personality and borderline personality disorder. So I work with a lot of doubt in my daily life. And aside from my profession, from my personal experience alone dealing with self-doubt and overthinking, I like to think that I'm somewhat of an expert on the topic of doubt. What I've learned both in my profession and my personal life is that doubt is both one of the greatest causes of distress in people's daily lives, but it is also ironically the antidote to most mental health problems. Give me a second and I will explain. You see, every day I deal with patients that suffer with anxiety, depression, fears, all types of phobias. And the common thing amongst all of these is that they are all rooted in doubt. Doubt in our own ability. Doubt whether any of this is real. Doubt whether any of this is worth fighting. Doubt if we're worthy of love or even if it's worth to keep on living. And what I tell my patients on a daily basis is that the cure to this, the antidote to this doubt, is ironically even more doubt. I tell these people to question those negative thoughts on a daily basis. You see, well, in psychology, we would call this doubt of our certainty as cognitive restructuring, which is the therapeutic process of examining and challenging your thought patterns to gain a different perspective on situations, ideas, or relationships. You need to consider the possibility that you may have been doing it wrong all along, and maybe you've been doing it wrong your entire life. I'm not saying to live in an idealistic fantasy where negative thoughts don't exist, but I'm telling you to question those thoughts to truly challenge those thoughts, to analyze, analyze that data and then consciously make a decision to take a leap of faith that your analysis of all these variables have brought you to the most accurate truth. What I just said. Um, so, the stories that I'm going to be covering today can be found in three of the Gospels. So if you have your Bibles with you, I would, look, I would love for you to jump to these stories, take note of them. If you don't have it yet, then please point your, your cameras to the, to the projectors, tap on that QR screen, and download the Bible app. This is not a paid promotion, but I promise you, you will not regret it. It is absolutely worth it. The three stories that I'm going to be covering today can be found in John chapter 6, verses 15 through 21, Mark chapter 6, verses 45 through 52, and Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. And to add some historical context before I go into these stories, um, please take note that this story takes place immediately after Jesus has just performed one of the most amazing miracles where he fed the 5,000 families using five loaves of bread and two fish. Or, for any of my fans of The Chosen, it's the season three finale, episode eight. It's a great show. If you haven't seen it, please watch it, especially after today's sermon. So, we're going to jump straight into John chapter, John chapter six and Mark chapter six. I'm going to read them back to back because these are the two shortest and the most similar of the three. So Jesus, perceiving that they were intended to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. Now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, and after getting into a boat, they started across the sea to Capernaum. It had already become dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea began to be stirred up because a strong wind was blowing. And then when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus 
walking on the sea and drawing near to the boat. They were frightened. But Jesus immediately said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. So they were willing to receive him into the boat and immediately the boat was at the land which they were going. Immediately. I'm sorry, that's the end of the first one. <laughs> I'm going to immediately go into Mark chapter 6, and you guys are going to realize that this is virtually the same story. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side of Bethsaida, while he, was, while he himself was sending the crowd away. After bidding them farewell, he left for the mountain to pray. When it was evening, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on land. Seeing them straining at the oars, for the wind was against them, at about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea, and he intended to pass by them. But when they saw him, when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed that it was a ghost, and they cried out. For they saw him, and they were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and he said, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Then he got up into the boat and he got into the boat with them and when the wind stopped, then the wind stopped and they were utterly astonished. For they had not gained insight from the incident of the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. So, what we can notice is that these two are basically the same exact story. And in both of these stories, and spoiler alert, Matthew chapter 14 starts out exactly the same. But in all of these stories, we see that Jesus sends the disciples ahead of him, alone on the boat. The disciples find themselves stuck in a storm. And when Jesus approaches them, when they first see Jesus, they become terrified. They become afraid. And that's the thing about the storm. It's really easy to proclaim the love and faith for Jesus when your life is going perfectly great and everything is sunshine and rainbows. But it's when you're caught in the storm that it's really easy to resent God, to confuse him for a monster, and maybe even as the cause of the storm, instead of the only one who can quiet the storm and bring you to your destination. As I was reading this story, I was reading all of these stories, I started to doubt my own certainty that me being here was a mistake. I don't think it's a mistake that I'm here today because this doubt that I'm talking about right now, I know all too well. You see, at the peak of my adolescence, at the peak of my rebellious adolescence, I started to doubt God, and I doubted God so much that I became atheist for over 10 years of my life. You see, from a very early age, I was, at 12 years old, I was already listening to extremely political and conscious music artists like Immortal Technique, um, Rage Against the Machine, and Public Enemy. And the thing about these people, these activists, they were activists disguised as entertainers and they really shaped the way that I think. They taught me to doubt authority. They taught me to question everything that was taught to me by the man and the mainstream narrative. They taught me to research everything for myself and to follow the evidence wherever it would lead me to. Regardless of cultural norms, or rituals or traditions that I was conditioned into believing. And at the peak of this rebellion, in 2007, when I was 17 years old, please remember this was six years after 9-11 had completely changed the world as I knew it. I came across a very hard to find but very popular documentary amongst the niche online conspiracy theory circles or some of you may call 
stoners who now listen to the Joe Rogan podcast religiously. You see, this documentary was before social media. This was before Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter, before anything became viral. And this documentary was talking about all the truths that I had learned throughout all my doubt and authority, throughout all my research, throughout my adolescence. It talked about everything from 9-11 to the conspiracies of the weapons of mass destruction to conspiracy theories about the Titanic and the implementation of the Federal Reserve to rob our people using infinite inflation. It talked about the JFK assassination and the moon landing. It was mind-blowing. This documentary was amazing to me. But the one part that really shook me, the one part that caught me off guard was the very opening of this documentary where it completely discredits Christianity and specifically the Roman Catholic Church as some type of Roman, pagan, occult cult that was built on a book of lies. I was taught that this story was built by a Roman pagan emperor named Constantine and by the Council of Nicaea. At a really very early age, I learned to see God as a monster. I started to doubt my belief in God. And this brings me to something that Kendall said last week during his message. 99% surrender means 100% control. It means 100% doubt. And even though I was raised a devout Catholic and I gave my life to Christ, I truly believed in my heart growing up that there was a divine creator, a God of love and a God of peace. But I was never really taught how to have a personal and intimate relationship with Christ. Don't get me wrong, I was definitely taught how to pray. I went to Sunday worship school. I learned about all the stories of Jesus in the Old Testament. I even knew that Jesus died for our sins, but I didn't truly know what that sacrifice meant. I didn't truly have a personal relationship with Jesus. So, at the peak of this rebellion, at the beginning of this doubt, I was still searching for God. I still believed that I could find that God that I so honestly and genuinely believed in. But I started searching for him everywhere and anywhere but the Christian Bible. I had made up my mind on Christianity completely. So I started, I started um, studying different, different things like psychology, philosophies, and world religions. Everything from Buddhism to Hinduism, the Kabbalah, and even my time exploring the mystical occult and New Age witchcraft. You see, later on in my, my life, I came to a very dark road. And I started experimenting with a lot of mind-altering substances. And I was able to peek into a spiritual realm. I saw that there was something that connected us all that we couldn't see with the naked eye. And I began my occult journey through the mystical arts. I was learning to become a certified hypnotherapist. And my goal was to become somewhat of a shaman or a guru. You see, all this, this new revelations about this spiritual realm that I was able to see, I wanted to introduce it to the world. I wanted to introduce it to the world by starting my career in hypnosis and start deep diving into past life regressions and using things like transpersonal psychology and psychedelic psychology. You see, my goal was to use strong 
mind-altering substances like MDMA, psilocybin, and DMT to introduce people to God. Disclaimer, I'm not encouraging this to anyone at all. I do believe that what I was seeing was a peek into the spiritual realm, but I now know that I was using the help of the wrong entities, a very dark demonic forces that came to a great cost in my life. It caused a lot of pain in my life. I was a man on a mission to find that true God and to help reveal him to the world that so desperately needed him. But fast forward through a lot more of the storm, a lot more self-inflicted pain and self-sabotaging, and I found myself in a deep, deep depression. And I was hitting rock bottom. I was drowning in the storm, and I was completely lost. I started experiencing a lot of doubt, a lot of fear, fear of abandonment, doubt in myself, doubt whether any of this is real, whether I would ever find the truth, doubt if I was worthy of love. But I wasn't looking for just any type of love. I was looking for real, unconditional, self-sacrificing, other person-centered love, the type of love that I knew that God had when I was a young and naive child. If we can read Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 29, it says, But from there you will search again for the Lord your God, and you will search for him with all your heart and soul, and you will find him. I was a young, naive child trying to find that God that I knew existed in my heart. But maybe as a child, I wasn't so naive. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 3, Jesus tells the disciples, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of God. At a very young age, I learned to see God as a monster. I didn't know where I would find this true God that I believed in, that I knew existed in my heart. But my mind was made up, and I definitely knew I wouldn't find him in the Christian Bible. I knew this because I did my own research. I looked into the atrocities of these man-made religious institutions. I knew all about the popes that ordered the Inquisitions and the Crusades, the popes who turned a blind eye to the Holocaust, and to the popes that turned a blind eye to child predators that were infesting their churches and taking advantage of the children of God that they were supposed to be shepherding. You see, now, as a newborn Christian, my favorite character in the Bible is the Apostle Paul. Because much like Paul, I was once Saul. And I despised and I persecuted Christians in my mind. I persecuted them for being hypocrites and for blaspheming the name of the Lord, which I thought I knew so well. But in hindsight, I see this storm a lot like Saul's road to Damascus. It was during the season of hiddenness from God. It was during the season of trials and tribulations and what seemed like unending infinite rock bottoms that I was humbled enough and desperate enough to fall to my knees and start considering the possibility that maybe I was doing this all wrong. That maybe I had been doing it wrong for a very, very long time. But my journey back to faith came with a lot of resistance. I'm telling you, Jesus basically brought me back kicking and screaming because I wasn't looking for Jesus. Or at least I didn't think I was. I didn't know that the God that I was looking for was standing right there next to me the entire time. He was suffering next to me, begging me to just shift my focus back to him, 
to recognize him for his true character and to take my first step in faith towards him. In Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33, we can read, Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he sent the crowds away. After he had sent the crowds away, he went up to the mountains by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to the water, to come to you on the water. And he said, come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on water and came towards Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened and beginning to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said, you of so little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind suddenly stopped. And those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. I don't know if you guys are following this. Or actually, another note. You see, there's something very significant about this verse. Matthew chapter 14, verse 33. This is the very first time and the only time in the entire gospel of Matthew that the disciples use this full title to address Jesus. Truly, you are the son of God. This was the very first time that the disciples truly recognized God for all his glory and all his character. They might have known him with his mind, with their minds, but they hadn't submitted 100%. If you don't believe me, let's go back to Mark chapter 6, verse 52, where it says, For they still had not understood the significance of the miracle of the loaves. Their hearts were too hard to take it in. I don't know about you guys, but when I read this story, I get frustrated with the disciples. Probably because I see so much of myself in them. How long have they been following the Messiah? They walked hand in hand with him. They saw him perform miracles firsthand. And they still didn't recognize who was standing in front of them. If we go to Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 to 27, we're going to see this is a little bit earlier, right before Matthew 14. This is not the first time that the disciples are stuck in a storm. Then Jesus got into the boat and started across the lake with his disciples. Suddenly a fierce storm struck the lake with the waves breaking into the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, shouting, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. And Jesus responded, why are you afraid? You have so little faith. Why do you doubt? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and suddenly there was a great calm. The disciples were amazed. Who is this man, they asked. Even the winds and the waves obey him. Who is this man? These people still didn't get it. How much evidence is enough evidence? This is the second time that they're stuck in a storm. And only six chapters ago, Jesus scolds the disciples for not having faith and for being consumed in fear. And yet in Matthew 14, we find them once again consumed by fear when they see our Lord and Savior. They still didn't recognize him for all his glory. I become frustrated with these disciples because I see myself in them. 
And a little side note, as you guys probably know, my brother who's right here, he's a county commissioner, and last week he was here with a, another county commissioner, our local county commissioner. And I tell my brother all the time, he's Daniel in the middle of Babylon right now. And I've seen how his political opponents use fake news and, and, and all these terrible stories to try to tarnish his name and his character. But there's no amount of fake news or documentaries that could ever make me believe that he's a bad man because I know my brother. I lived with him my entire life. He was my best friend. I know his character. So no type of documentary could ever tell me that he's a bad person. But when this stoner documentary tells me that my God is all a made up lie and that it's created by these power hungry liars, I instantly denounced my faith, instantly walked away, I believed it. And that was because I didn't have a personal relationship with God. I didn't truly know his character. I knew about him. I knew him in my mind. But I wasn't 100% in. Like Kendall said last week, 99% surrender means 100% control, 100% doubt. And unfortunately, the only way to destroy this doubt that's keeping you from reaching your destination, from reaching your fullest potential, is through taking a leap of faith and complete surrender. Not 99%, but 100%. I say unfortunately, because faith isn't something that you can intellectualize or that you can learn from a book or studying evidence. Faith is not something that you can know with your mind. Faith is something so amazing and so powerful that you can only access it through your heart and soul, through surrendering 100%. It's not something that we can know with our minds. The disciples knew with their minds that Jesus was God, that Jesus was the Messiah, but they had not submitted 100%. And the thing about faith, the thing about surrendering to something that you can't see or touch or intellectualize to an overthinker like me, to an overthinker with extreme control problems, that's one of the most frightening things in the world. I couldn't see, I couldn't, my need for control didn't allow me to relinquish that control to anyone other than myself. Again, I wasn't looking for God, but he came and he found me in the middle of my storm. It was in 2020 when I was 30 years old. It was during the middle of all the riots, the summer of love, the tearing down of statues, the tyrannical uh, COVID lockdowns and vaccine mandates that I started to recognize the season that we were in. For as far as I had come in my search for the divine truth, there was always something missing, something connecting it all together. The ultimate conspiracy theory to trump them all. The possibility that this loving God that I always believed in might actually be true. That Jesus might actually be real. And it was the moment that I started to doubt this certainty that I had that I started, I was bombarded by a lot of documentaries and a lot of, uh, a lot of biblical teachings about Jesus and about the Bible. Documentaries like the seven days of Noah, 
is Genesis history. A movie, The Case for Christ, which is uh, based on a true story. All these things were starting to make sense. And that scared me. The most reluctant convert, convert. And even Jordan Peterson, a person that I greatly, greatly admired. Partly because at the time he was an atheist. But even atheists were giving credit to the Bible. You see, this, this, um, this teaching that he had uh, at a university in, in, in Canada was a biblical study, but it was a secular biblical study, a psychological breakdown of the Bible, where it dismissed the religion and spirituality of it, but it looked for the truths found in that book. And this was something that I was able to consider. And, it was, that, and it, was, it was scary to me that I was getting rushed by all, these new, all this new evidence. And all of this evidence led me to the day of my baptism. Or actually the day of my brother's baptism. Because as many of you probably know, a lot of you have heard my story. I wasn't supposed to get baptized that day. My brother came to the Sabbath service that morning, gave his testimony to the entire church. Later that evening, we all went to the beach to witness him and some other uh, Arise members get baptized. And I remember on my way over there, starting to believe this conspiracy about God. I was 99% there. I was very convinced by all the research that I was doing. But I was still at 99%. I remember on my drive over there, I was praying and I was asking God that if I had an opportunity to get baptized that day, I would do it too. But it wasn't going to come from my own free will. I needed one more divine intervention. I needed one more miracle to prove to me that he was real. And boy... Did God call my bluff? You see, we were there, the baptisms happened, and everyone was starting to wrap up, started to pick up their stuff. Everyone was starting to walk towards, start, started to walk towards their cars. And I felt a slight sense of disappointment, but a huge relief that the miracle had not happened and that I was safe to continue my journey in doubt. But then God sent a Hail Mary and sent this beautiful man, Pastor Link. I don't know where he is. <laughs> and as I was walking back to my car, as everything had wrapped up, Link came and he hugged me in celebration. And he asked me, when is it your turn? When are you going to get baptized? And I don't know if Link saw it in my face, but my heart sunk. I saw that God called my bluff. Still trying to weasel my way out of it, trying to all smart the situation. I told him, you know, if I could do it right now, I would. But I was bluffing. Because the show was over. There's no way this would have happened. You see, the sun had already set. The baptisms were done. Everyone picked up their stuff and they were heading back to their cars. But God called my bluff once again. And Link dropped everything. He turned his back on me. He ran towards Kendall. He whispered something in his ear. And Kendall shouted, everyone come back. A miracle has just happened. <laughs> I was shooketh. I don't know what to do. I walked with Kendall, walking into the water, still holding on to dear life to that 1% of doubt. And it was at that last moment when I was standing in the water with Kendall as he was praying over me that I started, I finally asked myself the question, how much evidence is enough evidence? 
And it was at the very last moment before my head sunk into the water that I decided to take that leap of faith. You see, I didn't want to be a hypocrite. I didn't want to lie to the church. I didn't want to take this fake step in, 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 this fake step in faith. I wasn't sure, but I was 99% sure that this God thing was real. And if it was real, there's no way I could lie to him. So at that last moment, I took my step out of the boat and took my first step in faith towards Jesus. This baptism took place two years ago. And even though I've definitely stumbled since then, I have never turned back. And my life has been transformed in ways that I could never imagine. If God could transform and use me for his glory, then God could use anyone and everyone sitting here or watching online. But the only way to access this amazing, beautiful, unexplainable transformation, the only way is to destroy doubt, is to loosen your armor against God and to open your heart for the Holy Spirit to penetrate, to penetrate and to destroy the doubt that is keeping you from your fullest potential. There's a storm upon all of us. We've seen in at least four different stories today that when his people are lost in the storm, our focus needs to shift onto Jesus. The only one who can quiet the storm. The only one who after the storm will reveal himself for his true character in all his glory. The true son of God. I am flawed. I'm extremely flawed and I'm not qualified to be here right now. But one thing I've learned is that that puts me amongst the company of a lot of characters in the Bible. Time and time again, we see how God chooses the most flawed of individuals to see how he can transform anyone and everyone. And absolutely no one is too far gone to be saved by Jesus Christ. Despite all my doubt, despite all my fear, despite doubting in Kendall when he asked me to preach today, I chose to surrender and I chose to have faith that the Lord wanted me here today for a reason. And thank God that I have the humility to not try and get in his way. I pray that this message has touched the heart of at least one person that it would destroy that doubt that they're still hanging on to with dear life and that they may take that first step of faith towards Jesus Christ by surrendering their heart 100% through the act of baptism. And what an immense privilege it is to say that we have three brave people taking that step today. Carlitos. Johnny and Dailene, thank you for taking that first step of faith and taking that step towards Christ. I promise you it's an amazing transformation that you will never regret. So, if I can call Kendall onto the stage and we can witness this beautiful baptism. Thank you all so much for your time. Thank you for your attendance. I want to invite Link to come and join me down here. And anybody who shares a love for Daylene, for Johnny and Carlitos, if you guys could also come forward as well. We are here to celebrate a new birth. That's what the Bible calls baptism, being born again. 
So you know, ladies are first, you know what I'm saying? So Daleen is an unbelievable young lady. And she's here because, because of Aaliyah. Clearly the Holy Spirit is always there before any of us come to faith. But Aaliyah, I need you to be up here as well. She's here. <laughs> Link, can you hold this? So I want to invite Daleen to come forward and make your way. If you guys want to help her out, David, if you want to help her out, to just take the steps up here. When you come to faith in Christ, you never come alone. You're always with somebody. Yeah. The elders want to come up as well they can. So Daylene. We could baptize your glasses if you want. <laughs> how many of you wanna how many of you wanna just by a round of applause welcome Kate Daylene to the family? This, this young lady has to tell you her story. It's so amazing. And Daylene's story is a story of, of Jesus' mercy. And so today, because of your faith in Jesus, because of your faith in Jesus, because of your love for him, today in the presence of all of these witnesses, the ones on earth, but also the ones in heaven, it's my honor, it's my duty, it's my privilege to baptize you as a minister of the gospel in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So the next one up is Johnny. And Johnny, come on up, brother. Let's give Johnny a round of applause. David, come up here, bro. Come up, Carlito, I know you're next, but come up here as well, bro, because we wanna We wanna let you know that these these men are here with um you can sit down there. Johnny and David shared a life together far from God. And you are a talented drummer, you're a talented musician. But faith has been born in your heart. And you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ. I can't, I can't even imagine how miraculous that is. But God rescued David and God is using David to feed the homeless together with an amazing team every two weeks. We're going out there and just making an incredible difference. David, we're, we're just so grateful to see what God is doing through you. Johnny, because of your faith in Jesus, because today you are saying yes to him, the Bible says that all of heaven rejoices. The Bible says that your name is written in the book of life. All of your record of failure, sinfulness, is wiped away and replaced by the record of Jesus. That's the gospel. And today, because you've decided, together with your brother David, your brother Carlitos, together with everybody who loves you, 
heaven celebrates. As a minister of the gospel, I baptize you now. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Carlitos, Jesus knows your story, Papa. You have an incredible heart, man. You have a heart for the homeless, man. You know how happy you get when you're helping homeless people? I see it in your eyes, man. I see how pumped up you get when you're serving the poorest among us. And today, because of the love of Jesus in your heart, because you've gone through the journey, I can testify that you want to follow Christ. I declare victory in the name of Jesus in your life, Carlitos, and today, together with your friends and family, together with all of the witnesses in heaven and in earth, as a minister of the gospel, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. invite Diego to come back up because this is called fourth quarter two minutes left on the clock and it's first and goal <laughs> to win the game for Jesus man invite people to cross the line and pray for them man I'm so I'm so proud of you man I'm so grateful for what Jesus has done in your life If you may please bow your head and join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, dear Father God, thank you so much. Thank you for pulling me out of the storm. Thank you for revealing yourself to me. Dear Lord, I pray that you do the same for everyone and everyone standing here and watching online. May they be called to grow in a closer relationship with you. May they take that first step out of the boat and walk towards you in complete faith and 100% surrender. Dear Lord, thank you for these beautiful, amazing baptisms. I know you and all the, angel, all the he heavenly angels are rejoicing in heaven right now. Dear Lord, bless us, guide us, and accompany us in everything that we do. Bless our families and bless us on this beautiful Sabbath day. I pray this in your son's heavenly, almighty name, the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen, thank you all. Amen, thank you, Diego. Why don't you guys celebrate with us in his last song. If you guys wanna step up, come on, guys. We got a lot to celebrate. Come up here in the front, we're gonna have some fun. Clap those hands if you have a hallelujah you wanna share.
Clap those hands if you have a hallelujah you want to lift up to God today. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my 